Welcome to the talk about Linux Boot. Maybe you heard of it. It's, uh, yeah, let's say, a uh, firmware replacement uh, for a current firmware, or it's, let's say it's not a complete replacement. It replaces most of your parts and is uh, built together with your current firmware. For example, UFI, Core Boot, or U Boot. Um, thanks to Tremel Hudson providing me these uh, slides because yesterday I got uh, the information that I can do a talk or I have to do a talk here after someone cancelled his talk, so I'm a little bit unprepared. You know, I, I didn't do so much preparation, but it should work anyway. So let's start. So um, this guy is Ron Minich. Maybe you can see him on the left side. Uh, he worked a long time on data centers uh, for the government and also now for Google. Um, and he was also the founder of Corbu together with Stefan Reinauer. And on some point, they started a long time ago uh, the so-called Linux BIOS. Maybe you, have, maybe you have heard of it. It's, uh, it's uh, started in 1999. And yeah, after some time, they had to rename it. And uh, since 2008, it's Corbu. Yeah, basically, that's uh, what happened in the past. And Linux BIOS itself, the idea was that you use the Linux kernel instead of rebuilding your whole firmware with, let's say, your own implementation. And the problem was that in the past, there was not so much code in the Linux kernel. You know, we, ha we had bad graphics drivers. We don't, didn't have uh, printer support, whatever. You know what I mean. So the driver st stack was really bad. And so they couldn't do that. And yeah, they did their own thing. And today, it's called Core Boot. Yeah. You also have uh, this today in the most laptops you use currently. It's called UEFI, Unified Extendable Firmware Interface, and it was uh, introduced by Intel a long time ago, before it was called EFI and used by Max, and later it was called Unified um, Extendable Firmware Interface, and it was introduced by Intel and together with Microsoft. Um, currently, the firmware stack, or let's say the, the UEFI stack looks like this. You have um, the security phase, which is, does some kind of security stuff, then you have the pre efi phase, which is a platform initialization. That means that you have there the firmware support package, for example, and it does uh, memory in it and whatever. And after that, you have memory initialized. And then you have the DXE phase, which is basically drivers and so on, environment, whatever. And then you have also a boot device manager afterwards, and then it loads your <coughs> uh, bootloader. You can see that uh, first, final OS bootloader. And after that, you have your operating system or whatever. So this is a, the standard graphic. And what we plan to do is that we <laughs> have something like this. So we try to rip out everything, yeah, let's say, after the pay phase. So we need the pay phase. You know, normally, if you don't have memory, you can't use the Linux kernel. That's not working. So we could also do the memory initialization inside the Linux kernel, but that's not a good idea. And you would have something like additional init stuff. And that doesn't make sense. So we, we stay like this and just have the sec phase and the pay phase. And afterwards, we load Linux. And uh, yeah, then you can load your operating system. For example, Linux. It, you, we could also load Windows. It's not a problem at all. You know? <coughs> that can work as well. In terms of security. So if we look uh, at the UEFI uh, boot flow, it looks really complex, to be honest. Yeah? Um, maybe, uh, maybe this part, the SEC and uh, pay fast, is not that bad because it's really small. But if you look at the DXE phase, it's extremely huge. And it depends on the vendor how much modules are added there. So if you have a vendor which adds thousands of mod modules there, they have dependencies um, to each other. And that's also why your boot up is so slow, you know? They have, if you put, make a dependency graph out of the DXE phase, it's horrible. So they, they have a really long, so the boot phase takes a really long time, ex, uh, also on servers. For example, they, you wait 20 minutes to boot up your server. That's not really good. Yeah? It costs a lot of time and money. And <clears throat> also, the DXE phase can introduce a lot of uh, bugs because you have a huge amount of codes in there. And that's normally not a good idea. You can, you can look how many modules you have. There's only a few modules. You have different stuff in there. And sometimes vendors forget to remove stuff, and then there's more in it, and you don't need it. And that's normally not a good idea, because you want to have a minimal TCB, which is a trusted computing base. So keep your trusted com com uh, computing base always small, not big. Yeah. Um, also. In this, uh, in this uh, uh, schematic, we have uh, the grub, 
which is our bootloader, for example. But also, <coughs> Guap has a lot of code, and it's mostly C. <laughs> and um, in general, these are the, the biggest problems. Yeah? You ha don't have defense in depth. You have weakest links, and there's a lot of code in it. And if you look, we, ha we have compared some things. So you have UEFI, for example. You have Grub. You have uh, the Linux kernel. They all implement, for example, what is it this time? It's the T TCP stack. They all have a TCP stack. So your UEFI has a TCP stack. The Grub has a TCP stack. And your Linux kernel has a P TCP stack. So it's, code de uh, so it's code duplication everywhere really everywhere. And that's not a good idea. Same goes for FAT driver, file system driver, and whatever. So you can see that, yeah, USB and FAT. So whatever. It's, it's, it's completely, it's, it's a lot of code uh, du duplicated over some time. And yeah, that's not really good. So on the Linux kernel side, we have nearly unlimited contributors <laughs> on GitHub. <laughs> if you look at the EDK2 project, around uh, 144 uh, contributors and then we have Grub with 100 and C, so not so much Grub. So, and that's a problem in general. So the most developers doing Linux work and it's better maintained, you know? If, only, if for Grub, for example, you only have maybe one core developer, some other developers working around, but they don't care so much about the quality of the USB stack or the FAT file system rather, you know? And then you have bugs in it and security holes. And that's a problem. Um, yeah, currently this is uh, <laughs> this is an interesting picture. So with Core Boot, we had Linux Boot since 17 years. Yeah, because you always can load with Core Boot a Linux kernel, and um, normally that makes sense. You can use it on some devices, and it works fine. But um, today it's a change. The, the way of firmware development changed. We got more and more code everywhere and it's a general issue that we have so much code currently which initializes the platform itself. So uh, Intel started to have a project called Intel FSP which is a firmware support package and this uh, firmware support package itself is a, does a RAM initialization and afterwards you, you only do a small platform in it and then you can directly jump to the bootloader. Um, the FSP can currently be used with Core Boot together Afterwards, so you see this with a, um, examples. You have the pay and the sec phase. It's around. So we don't have that in core boot, but the same level. Um, we have core boot, the FSP, and afterwards you have the board in it, and then you load Linux boot. Um, same goes for UEFI. You have the pay and the sec phase. Afterwards, you load, lo load Linux boot. So Linux boot itself, it's it's um, independent from the firmware. It's the idea of having the Linux kernel doing all driver stuff you need to have for, for example, if you have a data center, you want to have a TCP IP stack for loading, uh, for example, images through Ethernet, or you have uh, different other use cases. For example, you can do in Linux boot, you can easily use VJet, uh, mount tempfs, the whole memory, then you just download, for example, an X server, inclusive a Mesa, through a network, and also load Atom editor started, and you have an Atom editor in your BIOS, yeah, on the flash chip. So in the memory, you can unpack it. It's, so I only want to say all the things you can do with the Linux kernel is really great. You have a small system, you can reduce it, and uh, you have two megabytes of Linux kernel loaded by the firmware itself. Yeah, and that's how it looks. Maybe you saw that on the Linux boot homepage. Um, so uh, the, the basic stuff is done in, um, for the RAM in it, which is a UEFI pay, core boot ROM stage, and U-boot SPL. And afterwards, you load the Linux kernel, including an init RAMFS, and then you can uh, jump into your oper operating system or do other things inside your firmware. Yeah, that's how it uh, works. So, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> that was short, but... So if you have questions, you can also, there's currently, um, there's a um, commit on Core Boot, which you can use. There's all, uh, already Linux Boot integrated in a better way. And you can also go to the Linux uh, Boot uh, GitHub and the linuxboot.org homepage. Yeah, and now questions. Yeah. 
Operation rooms from hardware get executed? Currently not because you don't need to do that anymore for, because you have the Linux driver. So the funny thing is, for example, VGA option ROM, so graphics in it option ROM, you can do that with the Linux kernel. You don't need the option ROM anymore for the Intel driver, for example. If you have something like an AMD driver or whatever, you can additionally include DXE files or option ROMs and load them. Works as well. So if we talk, for example, I can maybe extend it a little bit more in detail. We have, for example, the system management mode. You could ask uh, yourself, what's happening with the system management mode? We can do that inside the Linux kernel and later have an, some application uh, doing interfacing, whatever. So that works as well. Uh, regarding device tree enumeration, which is mostly used under x86, PCI device tree enumeration, uh, it's done inside the Linux kernel already. You can just check an option and it does it. So. There's no need uh, for, for, let's say, for core boot RAM stage or UEFI DXE phase, whatever, after U boot SPL comes, you know, you can just use the Linux kernel. Don't, de uh, don't duplicate code. It's a bad idea. So how long will it take before I can do this on my laptop? Uh, currently, you can do this with core boot as well, sure. And if we talk about uh, UEFI, currently we are on the way integrating that. We have already I guess three different types of servers running. They, they started with server work, so maybe it can take some time. And also we need support from, uh, from uh, Intel and other, uh, let's say, vendors because uh, it needs to be in this, inside the specification. Otherwise, you can load something different. And, you know, if you have Intel Boot Guard or any uh, protection mechanism which protects the firmware itself, you can change the firmware, sure, because it's signed. But if, they, if you have an option to load it into the, the firmware itself to some concept, then it works. So we are currently on the way doing that in discussion with them and see what we can do. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying keep your trusted computing base small, but the Linux kernel is enormous. Yeah. So is there any way to sort of get a smaller base that can then verify things later on? Yeah, so the trusted computing base for the unique. Repeat the question. For the mic. Ah, okay. So the question is, uh, if uh, the Linux kernel itself, uh, it has a huge uh, TCB, you say, and how to make it smaller, for example? Yeah, so that's how it can be done. So I got stripped down the Linux kernel to 1.6 megabytes. And if you look into the RFI code, it's, it's more. So for core boot, it may be less, sure. Uh, the Linux kernel currently is really big, but it's not that a big issue because it doesn't open interfaces, you know. It may in initialize as only drivers you need, and the core structure, which is really huge, it's mostly, let's say, set up for the kernel itself. It's not loading drivers. You can ma do uh, make tiny config, and if you, have tiny make, uh, if you have done it, then you can easily uh, strip out everything you need, or only add things you need there, and then it's really small. That works. How much work is needed to port this to a new UFI-based platform? Uh, so, how, okay, how much work is needed to port it to a new UFI platform? Um, so, we did that really fast. So, maybe you need a few days to do that. Sometimes it's really easy because you just strip out the DXE modules and you, then you just throw in the, the, um, the kernel itself and it works out of the box. Sometimes you have problems, but it depends on the vendor, what they did. And sometimes they did some wired stuff, you know. But in the, so if you have a uh, predefined interface and we are allowed to do that, then it's not a problem at all. Otherwise, it takes maybe a few days or one week. Yeah. Um, yeah, so how do we uh, enable one board components? Um, what do you mean by that? So, like, I, I was referring to see there is there is options that, that are some present in this uh, firmware setup, such as like um, um, putting the uh, data controller into IDE or M AXDI mode or code, like all, all, the, all the options that are available from the source. 
this can yeah th th so okay by yeah. set up okay so this can be done uh, normally uh, by parts of the so you can you you don't have to strip everything out of the ufa you know you can also keep some dxes or write your own dxe which does the job so that's what we currently do and we, we maybe have one dxe which does the job for ufa for core boot it's not a problem you have the code you can just uh, uh, modify it let's say or does your do your own implementation and then it works it's not a problem at all. You can do it at the uh, UFI layer. Works. We can also you you can also write a driver for for Linux itself. Yeah. What if that option is from a third party option ROM that you decided not to include in the payload? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what if? Yeah. What is if it's from a third party um, vendor? So yeah, then you have to reverse engineer that at the moment, but. Maybe we get some support, and we already did that, so it's not like you can't do it. It's, um, it's the first time it's some work, but I can tell you more. About, so I'm not the UFI guy, you know, and we have Tremel Hudson working on this. If you want to, to get some more information, you can ask Ron or Tremel Hudson. They do the whole work. Uh, I'm currently more on the core boot side, but I'm also looking into the UFI stuff, yeah. So what do we have currently in, uh, for the for the init RAMFS? The init RAMFS itself can be every init RAMFS. You can load your own init RAMFS. Uh, we currently use uwood, and uwood is a Go uh, in Golang written init RAMFS. Maybe you want to talk about that. That's yeah. your part. So, yeah. so he's one of the uwood developers. Just so yeah. One of the possibilities yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I'll be very quick. So one of the possibilities. Yep. On the camera. So one of the possibilities in your route is to have whatever RAMFS you want, and one of the RAMFSs we are working on is uh, called uroot, universal root. Um, this RAMFS is basically an open source RAMFS written in Go where you can actually have your toolchain, which is either a BusyBox-like toolchain, or a source code in your firmware that you can modify or compile on the fly on the firmware chip itself. And from there, you can literally wget your provisioning image and boot uh, your installation uh, software, or you can boot from disk, or you can ex kexec into your kernel, or do whatever, literally whatever you want. You basically have a l full Linux environment with a shell, and from there you can uh, compile your own code, uh, bring any existing, uh, already existing Linux tool, anything like that. So basically you are literally limited to whatever you can download in your uh, system and run from a Linux kernel, which we know is pretty, pretty broad limit. And uh, Linux boot is also linked from the, sorry, uroot is linked from the Linux boot website. So that's a very interesting project. Go have a look at that. And we are looking for Go developers that want to uh, make it better so we can get a UI, better tooling, etc. But you can also use, for example, the heads in the RAMFS. It's yeah. already there. So there are different in the RAMFS also. And do whatever you want. You can also just implement something in Rust or C. Have fun. So this is um, so you mean uh, that you have, for example, in recovery mode. So yeah, something like that, or pre-boot So there, there are different options. So if you have control over your own init RAMFS, you can implement it there. In theory, you can also use uh, firmware mechanisms like for core boot. We have vboot with some failure safety, so it will just uh, jump to another um, image uh, inside the flash itself and execute that if that works, and if not, the read-only part. It depends on the firmware. So you can implement it in uh, in Go. Currently, it's not there, or in other, any other language, and or you do it in the firmware, which is currently, yeah, the normal way how you do it. If you if you want to get core boot on it, you have to first do uh, the hard so the basic so you need to check if the platform in it is uh, already available for your architecture. And if it's available, you have to adapt that. And if you talk about UEFI, for example, it's, it's already there. So you just pull the UEFI image, 
just strip down every DXE module, put the Linux kernel in it, and just start it. That's what you do with your FI. On the most laptops, there is no core boot installed, you know what I mean? So you can do more work on the core boot side, or you just uh, pull out the uh, UFI image, modify it, and put the Linux kernel in it. Works as well. It's easier for you, because you don't need to understand how the hardware in it works. That's the thing. So that's why we're working with, with different firmwares. We don't care if you use core boot or UFI or U-boot or whatever. Yeah. And so, can you give some news about this Linux Foundation announcement, for example? And yeah. So, and the question, the other question is, when can you actually buy it in the stores and put it on the server? How <laughs> is it a possible thing, or? Yeah, so let's say, so the question is, if, if you can buy it and where to get it and uh, when, uh, when it's done. The thing is, this always takes a long time. To be honest, uh, modifications in the firmware level, it's more like decades, yeah? Maybe you can buy it soon. For example, currently there's uh, server hardware out there from the Open Compute project that works with Linux boot. You can already uh, download images, just flash it on the chip and it works. So, but until we do laptops or desktops, that's a different level, you know. Uh, maybe you can do that, but then we need, need to have uh, vendors as well, which allow us to, to flash firmware, for example, because normally these are assigned and it's not allowed, so it can take a while. Maybe it's adapted there, but we will see. That always depends on your vendors, and to be honest, just buy from vendors which are really, let's say, which, which try to be more open. For example, if it's not perfect, even then buy Prism hardware, buy Chromebooks, buy whatever, which, is, which includes open source firmware, you know. U boot laptops or whatever, just use that instead. That's my opinion about it. So because otherwise it never changes because you're only a small amount of people and you have seven million, uh, billion people out there, they don't care about it. <laughs> 